um, that book, I explored the beauty and wonder and awe, um, the experience of that in science and in for people of faith and, of course, people who are both. Um, and I have three beautiful images now, photographs, the kind of things that scientists, certainly biologists, love to show off in their presentations. Um, and uh, we can enjoy those. And I wanted to find out, having written that book, I wanted to do some, in a sense, almost like a case study with several scientists. Let's see the next couple of nice pictures. Um, and to ask people, what does the experience of beauty or awe or wonder, there's another picture of a lovely coral reef, um, what does that mean to you in science? Um, what are the things that you discover in your sciences? What's cool, what's interesting? How does it feed into your faith? What questions does it make you ask scientific and otherwise? Um, so I chatted to six scientists, most of whom are here, but I have pictures of them on the next slide, um, and two theologians who have an interest in science. And I wrote about their work. They very tolerantly fed me lots of information, corrected my mistakes, especially Rhoda. I have to give her a grand mention for uh, correcting the way I mangled um, theoretical physics uh, so patiently. And the other thing I wanted to do, as well as uh, helping people to explore the science and the questions it raises, um, was to think about some new metaphors. So the next slide lists the six scientific chapters. And the metaphors um, that came up that, that are there largely came from the scientists themselves, I think, especially the first four. Um, these are ways that people think about their work. Um, they are a lot more positive than some of the metaphors we hear thrown around in the world of uh, science and faith. Um, I hope that they will stick in the mind and make you think, what do you mean the snuggle for existence? What would a map of life look like? Why are cells dancing? Um, and what we're going to hear tonight is uh, we'll hear from uh, these uh, five of these six people. Um, we will hear um, direct from the horse's mouth, so to speak, um, in the book. We can see in the next uh, slide, there are lots of beautiful images drawn by the artist Danny Allison, who uh, sadly wasn't able to be here because he's working tonight. But um, And then also some photographs that people around the world very kindly let us use. Um, so we're sharing the full visual experience. And um, I hope you enjoy uh, the stories that you'll hear from the scientists tonight. And um, at the end, Cara, um, who's the next speaker, and I will share some details of some of the resources that go with it. And then there'll be time to ask a few questions. As Michael said, do put your questions in the chat um, and we'll get through as many of them as we can at the end. So thanks for coming. Um, I hope you enjoy your little tour uh, of the wonders of the living world and that it whets your appetite uh, for the stories that um, I've reproduced in the book. So the next speaker is Cara Perrette, who uh, is a marine biologist. And uh, after working on the Wonders Project, she went back to Cambridge University to do some research and support, support work, but couldn't resist coming back on the Faraday team to join our youth and schools team. So over to you, Cara. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Cara Perret, and I was Ruth's research assistant for the Wonders of the Living World project. Um, I loved working on this project, first of all. Um, I was relatively new to the whole idea of thinking about science and religion in deeply interconnected ways. Uh, so this opportunity, even just to meet religious scientists, was it's, itself kind of deeply exciting for me. Um, and then to be able to explore their work and also learn how their faith interacted with that work, well, it was a massive honour, uh, really. Um, I suppose the chapter which speaks most to my personal background uh, is Margaret Miller's chapter on living cities. And uh, Michael, you wanna, might want to do the next slide. There you go. Uh, which focus on coral reefs. Um, I love the city analogy uh, because when you're swimming above a coral reef, kind of looking down, there might be another one, Michael, there, uh, you really do feel like you're looking down at kind of living apartment blocks. 
uh, just filled with life, uh, the hidden coral polyps uh, inside the hard structures, but then also the multitude of different animals kind of living, hiding and hunting around and in between uh, the coral. Uh, as my mum said when she visited us when we were working in the Maldives, it really feels like you're flying kind of above an entire new world, a really complex system, almost like a civilization. Um, but then you also get to dive down and you really feel like you're in that bustle of life uh, with different characters moving around uh, with their own agendas, their own characters, their own habits. And I have such strong memories of snorkeling um, in the Maldives, kind of just diving down and then waiting and seeing what what's going to emerge uh, from all the hiding spots and from the protective arms of the coral um, or being faced with like an oncoming school of little convict fish and just staying really still and they just come at you, divide around you and keep going and it really feels like you're, you're on a highway. <laughs> you were right there in the in the rush hour. Um, and so just that bustle of life, it's just it's so city like and it's so beautiful and it's so diverse. Um, although the more you meet and watch this bustle of life, the harder it does hit when you dive down onto maybe a damaged uh, or desolate reef. Uh, it, it's kind of a bit post-apocalyptic if you think about a city um, when everything's rubble, kind of covered in algae, a few grazers kind of here and there, uh, but nowhere near that level of life and vibrancy. And so that powerful contrast can really make, uh, can really motivate conservation interest and also just a desire for really wise stewardship. Uh, and so I really hope you enjoy diving into that chapter, but also the whole book. Um, yeah, I love it. I can't wait to get my hands on <laughs> the copy again. Um, and as Ruth said, yeah, after, after the project, I stayed in the university with some science communication roles. Um, but as of last October, I'm back at the Faraday Institute on the youth and schools team, which is great. And we focus on helping young children of um, all ages explore positive science faith relationships through sessions and resources. Um, so that is me. And enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs> Thank you, Cara. That's great to hear from you. And we're so glad you're back at Faraday. And the, the next uh, scientist you're going to hear from is Professor Jeff Hardin, who's the chair of integrative biology at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I had the privilege of visiting the campus, meeting Jeff for the first time long time ago <laughs> now, uh, but I had a wonderful chat all about beauty. He also studied theology and is vice chair of the board of the Biologos Foundation, which we have, um, well, certainly my work has some close, link with, close links with um, in the US. So welcome, Jeff, over to you. Well, thank you, Ruth. Um, well, uh, it's a privilege to be here. I have to say being a part of this project was incredibly invigorating and encouraging to focus on the positive aspects of, of wonder in the living world. For me, wonder is pretty important as a scientist and a Christian. After my undergrad career and a Master of Divinity degree, it was with a great sense of excitement that I returned to academic science for a PhD in biophysics at UC Berkeley. But my first year was, as is often true, quite frankly, a slog. The luster of wonder definitely suffered. But then I stumbled on the one developmental biologist in the biophysics program, Ray Keller, who became my advisor and for whom my current professorship is actually named. When I first laid eyes on a developing sea urchin embryo under the microscope, watching its developmental program unfold, I was completely captivated. That sense of wonders remained undiminished ever since, and it's motivated me as a professional scientist for nearly 40 years. And it's that same sense of wonder that I try to communicate to undergraduates in my embryonic development course every year. I begin by talking about wonder as a motivation for study. And I like to quote Albert Einstein. He said this, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It's the source of all true art and science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger who no longer pauses to wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead. I tell my students that if by the end of the semester they think embryos are cool, then I've accomplished my primary task as an educator. If I could have the, my one slide, please. And of course, embryos are truly wonderful. This is what all of us did as embryos. We started as a one-celled zygote, and then we ended up looking very much like my son Christopher about 32 years ago in the lower left. It's a remarkable process. 
Normal embryos that say symmetries and stored molecules in the egg that are leveraged to generate differences in cell identity as the zygote divides, first into two cells, then four, then eight, and so on. In short order, the embryo starts turning on different genes, making unique sets of proteins that characterize these different identities. That's something that scientists call differentiation. But there's a second process that I find even more fascinating and goes hand in hand with differentiation. It's the process of building the embryo, known as morphogenesis. This is especially dramatic during a process known as gastrulation. And the next phase, neurulation on the lower left, when each of us looked like a burrito if you're in the US or maybe pita wrapped around a falafel at a takeaway stand if you're in the UK. Morphogenesis involves complicated cellular choreography as cells move in specific directions to shape the embryo. Maybe think of the gorgeous ballroom dances in your favorite Jane Austen adaptation, or if you're from Texas in the Southern US like my wife Susie, you might prefer to think of line dancing. Morphogenesis is the process that fascinates me most and it's underscored the fact that each of us is truly a self-made person. Well, how should we think about these processes from the perspective of Christian faith? People of faith have been thinking about this for a long time, for millennia. In my embryonic development class, I also quote a piece of ancient Hebrew poetry. It's what we call Psalm 139. For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I'll give thanks to you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Now, the psalmist knew nothing of early embryonic development in the way that we do, and yet he understood it as a process. The unformed substance there is the word golem, for you J.R.R. Tolkien fans. Uh, and the Hebrew word wove in verse 13 refers to knitting fabric. That's an apt choice given what we now know. The psalmist also understood embryonic development as, understand, as unfolding God's providential care over his life. Now to me, modern developmental biology reinforces these ideas of process and providence. Embryonic development is incredibly contingent. Each of us is a unique individual depending on the uniting of a specific sperm and a specific egg. That lucky sperm, if we arose in the natural way, had a one in 250 million chance of fertilizing a particular egg. But development's also robust because the processes of self-making result in such reproducibility as my son Christopher shows on the lower left in this picture. Now, does that kind of modern understanding diminish a Christian understanding of who we are? Well, not to me. The Victorian theologian Charles Kingsley said it this way, are we to reverence him, God, less or more, if we hear that his might is greater, his wisdom deeper than we ever dreamed? We knew of old that God was so wise that he could make all things, but behold, he's so much wiser than even that, that he can make all things make themselves. Hmm. Kingsley was talking about evolutionary history, but he could easily have been talking about embryonic development. Now to me, perhaps most remarkable, as I think about what Christians have affirmed through the ages, is that God himself has entered into these same developmental biological processes through the incarnation. Lucy Shaw said it this way in her poem, Made Flesh. After the bright beam of Annunciation fused heaven with dark earth, his searing, sharply focused light went out for a while, eclipsed in amniotic gloom. His cool immensity of splendor, his universal grace, small folded in a warm, dim female space. Now to me, that's great mystery, but it's also cause for wonder indeed. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jeff. He has some wonderful quotes there. And um, on to another part of life. We're going to hear from Margaret Miller, um, who's another marine biologist who um, provided the content for the marine biology chapter in um, Living Cities. She's the research director of SECOR International, which is a conservation organization for the protection and restoration of coral reefs. Over to you, Margaret. Thank you so much and good evening, good afternoon to all of you. Um, I will just echo that it's really been a privilege to be a part of this project. It was actually the first opportunity that I've had to be involved in sort of 
an inter a project with the intersection of, of science and faith and those aspects of my life had always been fairly separate before. And so it's really um, been a wonderful opportunity to, for me. Um, I guess I'll, I'll bridge a little bit perhaps if I can have uh, my slide between what uh, Jeff Harden was just speaking about and, and the city that Kara had mentioned. So this photograph uh, is showing a drop of water that's maybe a centimeter across and a bunch of little sort of pink orange specks um, are, are, are positioned in that drop of water. And these are actually coral embryos. Um, these are the babies uh, from which those uh, massive cities, um, the structures that are coral reefs um, from whence they come. And uh, in my current vocation and my current job, this is actually the focus um, of much of my work is trying to restore the fruitfulness of corals and coral reef systems. And so um, as, as uh, our human stewardship um, in many regards of our environment and our ocean, especially um, have sort of not been up to uh, God's standards, I would say, in terms of taking care of these systems and helping to maintain their functionality and their mutual provision. Um, this is the focus of much of my effort is trying to steward and husband these small tiny specks um, into what, if you can hit the next slide, please, into these amazing cities that, that Kara had, had mentioned. And um, unlike the embryos that Jeff showed a moment ago, um, these embryos have to go through that entire complicated process unprotected in the open ocean. And um, over the years that I have been working uh, with coral reproduction and, and coral embryos and coral babies, um, I think this is the aspect of wonder that continues to amaze me. And that is the miracle that corals exist at all in this world. Um, the, the complicated developmental steps that, that Jeff described biologically, but then the ecological context and the, um, the environment in which those steps are needing to occur, um, the capabilities that those little tiny specks have um, to sense their environment, even though they don't have a brain and they don't have eyes and they don't have ears, yet they can hear and they can see um, and they can use all of these cues that are provided in their environment um, to try to make a choice um, of a home that is going to sustain them throughout their lifespan. So I think this is the aspect of wonder that I would share with you this evening is this miracle that these tiny little specks can build such beautiful and magnificent and functional um, systems that we can think of as cities but um, that provide this sort of mutual provision um, amongst all of the parts, um, if they're functioning the way that, that God designed them um, to function. And um, I have the privilege um, of, stud as I said, studying that process and helping it along um, in some very rudimentary ways um, to try to encourage that replenishment and fruitfulness um, of these amazing uh, ecological systems. So I'll, I'll close there. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. What an amazing process. And um, the next um, person, we, we don't need the slides for this person. This is um, going to hear from Professor Stephen Freeland, uh, who's a computational biochemist. He's worked at the NASA Astrobiology, Astrobiology Institute and is now Director of Interdisciplinary Studies at the University of Maryland in Baltimore County. Over to you, Stephen. Thank you, Ruth. And yeah, you just heard there why I've not got any slides. Um, unlike my illustrious colleagues, I, I do theoretical molecules and math, and I'm not going to torture any of you with that. It just doesn't look as good. So, I mean, for the sake of this book launch, let me just reiterate, it's been an absolute pleasure to be involved with such an interdisciplinary range of perspectives on science and faith. And my story is, is about an unusual feature of life's genetic code. Um, but really for you today, I just want to say that my story is along with all of the rest of them, that curiosity is what we seem to be built for. Curiosity is what drives us as scientists. We're made for that. And the real wonder of the living world to me remains that we can be curious about it and we can find meaning within it. So when it comes to me, it's finding unusual patterns. I guess that's true of all of us really. But the paradox for me is that where I find unusual patterns near to life's origin, early evolution, they actually seem to tell us something about a predictable outcome something about the way life is meant to be in the universe. Uh, that was my first big finding as a graduate student 25 years ago, and it remains what I do today, and I love it. It fills me with um, humility. 
to think we're a part of something so enormous, so complex, but we're allowed to understand it. More than that, we're invited to understand it. More than that, we're created to understand it. So please read on. And I think that's really all I need to say for today. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, some very intriguing questions there um, for us to explore. And um, the next uh, person you're going to hear from is uh, our, one of our theologians. This is Dr. Hilary Marlowe. And um, Hilary is an affiliated lecturer at the Faculty of Divinity in Cambridge University. She's also just been voted in as Vice Mistress at Girton College, uh, Cambridge University. And um, we were had the privilege of having Hilary on staff at Faraday Institute most recently when she was course director for a number of years. So thank you, Hilary, for joining us tonight. Thanks very much, Ruth. And I have to say how glad I am that this project has finally reached the stage we are tonight. Um, and uh, the fact that I was working in Faraday while the project was in development meant that I saw not only the high spots, but some of the low spots that inevitably come with producing such a complex book with so many different moving parts. And I think Ruth and her research assistant, Cara, need a tremendous uh, pat on the back for, for having got it to this part. I know it wasn't always easy, Ruth, so, so well done, all of you. Mm -hmm. I, I um, My story is, well, if I'm telling a little bit of story to a group of school children, say, I often startle them by saying, can I have the first slide, please, Mark? Um, that I live in the White House, and you can see them thinking, oh, but actually, if you put the next slide up, you'll see that I do indeed live in a house called the White House, but it's not in Washington, D.C. It is actually older than the White House in Washington. Um, and I'm actually very privileged to live in a lovely little cottage surrounded by a garden, as you can see, with mature trees, and in the foreground, the fields, that is also part of our land, which has now, since this photo was taken, been planted up with fruit trees, so it's an orchard. And on the left of your screen now, there's a pond. So it's an incredibly wonderful place, especially on sunny days like we've had this weekend in which to live. So my story is this, about five years ago, we had a solitary barn owl flying, hunting across the fields. And more uh, in a just sort of a, let's see what happens. We put a barn owl nest box up on a big tree at the end of the fields. And a couple of years later, 18 months, years le months later, I actually was in Kenya lecturing on a Faraday course, would you believe, when I got a text from my husband saying, there are two barn owls on the ledge box of the nest, the ledge of the nest box. And it was the most exciting thing that happened to me on that trip. And I think the people I was with thought I was a little bit gone uh, gone barking mad but since then we've had barn owls breed every year except last year actually and sometimes they bred two two broods but the real highlight that um just really spoke to me of the awe and wonder that having such magnificent creatures nesting on your own patch of land was about three years ago we were put in touch with someone who's a licensed bird ringer, bird bander, I think you say in the States for, for barn owls. And it's a very kind of a specialist category. And he came and he got his ladder and he climbed up and he brought out the barn owl chicks. If you could show the next slide, please. And we had our nine-year-old grandson with us, Jack. And that expression of his face as he holds this owlet and he whispered under his breath, it's like being in a David Attenborough film. And it was just this wonderful moment. You could see the awe that it inspired in him. And the rest of us were, had moist eyes. But it, it, just seeing that kind of engagement of a young child with the living world, the world, the, na the, the incredible humility it brought about for me that this these creatures, these beautiful creatures had chosen to make our plot of land their home. And it felt so moving. It made me feel so awestruck, such a sense of wonder that I was able to offer hospitality to these other wild creatures. I love offering hospitality to human beings, but the fact of offering hospitality 
to other creatures as well really fills me with a sense of awe because you see them flourish and that makes me so so glad I see it as a God-given privilege and responsibility to be able to offer that hospitality and that governs the way that I, I um, till the soil and garden and the things I don't use on it like pesticides and herbicides and so on but also it feeds into a sense of worship to God and the more that we learnt from this bird ringer about the the way that the owl is designed for example for silent flight and the way his wing feathers made him efficient in the air and all the details that we learnt just led me to to praise the creator the, there's a, psalm, a verse in, in the Psalms that talks about the whole of the heavens declaring the glory of God, referring to the starry skies, but also other places where it talks about all creation existing to praise God. That's the purpose of creation. It's not just a human prerogative to praise and worship God. So the question that always lingers in my mind and is the challenge, a challenge for all of us at a time of environmental degradation, and um, loss of rainforest species extinction is how can we enable the whole of creation to flourish and to be able to continue to offer its praise to God? I think that is a huge privilege and a responsibility for us all. Thanks very much, Ruth. Thank you, Hilary. What a beautiful picture of the barn owl. The privilege to have those. I love the idea of offering hospitality to to other creatures. So we have two more speakers left. Um, the next one is Professor Jeff Schloss, who is the Distinguished Professor in TB Walker, Chair of Biology at Westmont College in California. I think he wins the time zone uh, competition uh, furthest away from the UK. Um, where he, and he, it's there that he directs the Center for Faith, Ethics and Life Sciences. And he is also involved in the Biologos foundation that I mentioned as a senior scholar. So welcome, welcome, Jeff. Well, thank you, Ruth, uh, for convening us and for your investment on this project. One of the wonderful things for me has been to see what others um, take wonder and delight in. And that's one of the joys of science, not only discovering your own wonder, but being uh, inspired by the wonder others take. So um, a little snippet from my story. When I was in grad school, um, Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene came out. That was actually a popularization of uh, some technical works that had come out by other authors uh, before. But the basic point of view there was um, the evolutionary biologist David Barr says, what's in it for me is an ancient refrain of all life. And George Williams, whose work um, inspired Dawkins on this, says, comments natural selection is a um, process for maximizing selfishness. So there's this picture of the world that was um, intrinsically competitive and, and selfish. And of, of course, living things need to maintain their selfhood. That's what being alive is, uh, controlled disequilibrium with the environment. But are living things really intrinsically selfish? Um, Darwin himself commented uh, on the phrase, the struggle for existence sometimes could mean the struggle with each other, not against each other, uh, with each other against external physical uh, challenges. So here I want to share an idea, what I think is a grand idea, and then an example of the idea. Some years later, uh, evolutionary biologist named John Maynard Smith and colleagues came, um, published a really influential book in a series of papers on what they called major transitions in evolution. These transitions are not things like the development of a nervous system or movement from water to land or the development of a backbone, but the transitions they had in mind were thematically consistent series of transitions and what they called cooperative interdependence. Simple prokaryotic cells merging together to form a more complex eukaryotic cells, single cells coming together to form a multicellular organism, asocial organisms coming together to form eusocial uh, colonies or societies. And the, the thematically consistent continuities in these transitions are, first of all, not just cooperation, 
but obligate cooperation, cooperative interdependence, where I can't make it without you. And, and secondly, specialization of labor, where we achieve this interdependence by you do something really well and I'll do something else really well. And um, this view has exerted really profound influence. And I think it, that idea itself is wonderful. And for me, actually reiterates this biblical notion of um, it's in relinquishing our autonomy that we gain true autonomy. And all these examples that I just gave are examples of organisms who had an independent autonomy and that in relinquishing it actually gained function. So what's the example? Well, I've spent a good deal of my career looking at the lichen symbiosis, which is a symbiotic union of a fungus and an algae. And they both have their tasks. The fungus provides a physical structure for the algae and it holds water so that the algae can exist in places that it wouldn't normally be able to. And the algae makes food for the fungus. So the bottom line is this. Um, first of all, this lichen symbiosis, this kind of amazes me. It raises interesting um, philosophical questions of natural kinds. But we have two different species living together, and now we call them a new species, Cladonia rangiferina, Cladonia mitis, these species of lichens that, uh, in a sense, are a new creature. And they, they are able to live in places where neither of them could live alone. And lichens colonize amongst the greatest range of, of areas on Earth, from equatorial deserts to temperate forests to boreal woodlands. And they have amazing differences in structure. So sometimes you may see lichens growing on the side of a rock, and it may just look like the rock has been painted with a thin paint of black, but those are crustose lichens. And you can see them hanging from trees as large stranded beards in temperate rainforests or where I did my work. And by the way, this is my field site in Northern Michigan. There's spongy um, carpets that cover the entire forest floor. I just think they're beautiful. They're an example of cooperation, achieving uh, an end result that couldn't have been possible without it. And I think they're amazingly beautiful. And I'll close with a quote from botanist and natural theologian, John Ray. Ray says, while my eyes feasted on these sites, my mind too was stimulated. I became inspired with a passion for botany. There is for a free person, no occupation more worthy and delightful than to contemplate the beauteous works of nature and honor the infinite wisdom and goodness of God. Thanks, Ruth. Thank you, Jeff. That's great to hear the, the necessity of cooperation for life itself. And I have to say, Cara and I both really enjoyed exploring all these areas of science when we were doing our research. Um, and uh, the papers that people have been writing on these and uh, finding ways of turning them into stories that we can share in the book. So the last but not least speaker is Dr. Rhoda Hawkins, who is the senior lecturer in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Sheffield. I don't know if she's our most northerly speaker, possibly. Um, I don't know if Jeff or Rhoda win. Um, and she's a visiting lecturer at the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences. And Rhoda is a member of the Christians in Science Committee. I have to give Christians in Science a mention as well, if you've not heard of them um, and you're interested in this discussion, uh, maybe you should join. But um, over to you, Rhoda. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to start, Ruth, by congratulating you on this beautiful book, which inspires wonder in me, even though I was one of the people who had the sneak preview of seeing earlier drafts. It's wonderful that it's, uh, it's out now and that's fantastic. And um, I'd like to start with my first slide, please, um, to say that as well as being a scientist, I, I also like art, in particular impressionist paintings. And um, I, uh, I, I love the fact that when you look really close, at uh, an impressionist painting you see all these kind of splodges and um, blobs of paint and and yet when you take a step back you see this beautiful picture emerging 
And um, this is one of the analogies that Ruth mentioned earlier, um, that is an analogy to the, the kind of work I do. Um, so the chapter I was collaborating on is called Artistic Molecules. Um, and the molecules inside living cells are moving around in random positions and random motion um, due to the heat energy that they have. Um, and yet combined with chemical energy that comes from um, the food that they eat or directly from the sun for plants. Um, this random motion um, of the molecules comes together such that they self-assemble and what emerges is order and beauty and purpose. And that's something that fills me with wonder and awe um, at looking not just at the beauty of the um, biological cells, but also um, as a theoretical physicist at the beauty of the elegant simplicity of some of the um, mechanisms that underlie this um, and the way in which we can attempt to describe that using mathematics. Um, I'd like to give you just one example um, and, and that is an example of an actin filament. Could I have the next slide please? Um, and if you can see my, my video, I've got a little model here of um, a filamentous protein. It's made up of lots of little blobs. Um, and um, this, um, this filament um, polymerizes at one end more likely than the other. Now, what that means is that subunits add on at one end like that, but they fall off at the other end. And so over time, what happens is a treadmilling effect where the whole thing, uh, the filament moves in a particular direction. And yet the particular timing and which, which um, uh, molecule adds on is random. And yet the overall picture is one of um, direct direction and, and movement in, in this case. Um, and so that, that just fills me with, um, with wonder at the intricacies of the complex systems that we find in uh, the living world, but also the the beauty and purpose that emerges um, and the privilege that we as scientists can have to um, try to understand something of that. And uh, from a physics perspective, that requires trying to simplify these highly complex um, biological systems to a point where we can try to understand something of what's going on in, with simple models. But the other thing that inspires me by um, looking at these things is further questions. Every time I look into um, something in the living world, in the living cell, and try to understand it, um, I, it generates more questions than I answer. And I find that questioning per process, that wandering process in itself exciting um, and spurs me on. And if we think about our own lives, um, as a Christian, I, I believe that God uses these random processes in the living world to generate order and beauty and purpose. And the same might be able to be said for our everyday lives. Sometimes the details in our lives seem random or even a bit of a mess. But maybe God has purpose in those details that will only become clear when we have a greater distance, a greater perspective, just like those blobs in the Impressionist painting. When we we're able to step back, we might be able to see God's bigger purpose um, in our lives. So that's everything I'd like to say. And um, thank you, Ruth, for um, including me in this fabulous project. Thank you, Rhoda. And um, yeah, so there are more uh, lovely illustrations of those processes. Uh, in the in the book, so that's the end of our um, our our. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to share a new screen. That's the end of our presentations from our scientists and theologians. But what's left to do is for me just to tell you a little bit about the resources that we made to go with the book. So we spent Car and I and others have spent a considerable amount of time putting together things. 
to help you unpack uh, what's going on there. And you can explore at your own um, leisure, wonders of the living world dot org. Um, and of course, if you go to the Faraday Institute website, uh, you'll find the Faraday Churches section of the website as well, uh, where this is linked from. So there's two places, two ways to find it. Um, you may have explored the website, or but you may not yet have seen um, what was put on there at 5.30 uh, this evening <laughs> by me, which are the uh, materials for church small groups. So if, if that's your, um, if you're, you're from a Christian church background, um, you might be looking for material for your small groups. And um, there are three introductory sessions based on the work of uh, Margaret and Jeff Hardin and Steve Freeland, uh, which have been thoroughly tried and tested, including in my own church. And then there are some other sessions uh, that are, um, we've uh, just uh, upped the level a little bit um, for groups that are really keen to learn a bit more, um, uh, whose curiosity has gone quite wild. Um, and um, you can explore um, the work of uh, Jeff Schloss, Rhoda, and uh, Simon Covey Morris and ask some quite deep questions. Um, but those um, should be accessible to everyone, whether you have scientific background or not. Um, <clears throat> and those sessions make use of videos of all our scientists um, with some pictures as well. And you can explore those videos for yourself um, in your own leisure. And we'll be releasing more videos um, over the next few months. And um, I have mentioned that um, Cara is now working for the Ethan Schools team. And actually, while she was working on this project, she helped to develop the school material for older secondary people. So I'll just let her give you a little tour of that just now. Uh, thanks, Ruth. Did you want me to share my screen? Sorry, I wasn't prepared to do that. So I'll just... you, you, uh, you, you may do so, or I can start sharing again if you like. <laughs> Um, so fortunately in the UK, the religious studies specifications require that students uh, study a few topics which call on both science and faith. And so I suppose if this is done well, it's a great opportunity to have those deep nuanced um, discussions at a school level. Um, but as we know, teachers are stretched, the curriculum is really full. And so it can be quite hard to get those discussions going in that very nuanced uh, way beyond what is mentioned in the textbook. So what's great about uh, this opportunity is that we got to use uh, these scientists work their faith and their words through the videos and we're hoping to kind of bring them into schools using these videos to just stimulate that deeper level of discussion with the children and also uh, that personal connection where they can see them and identify them as, as real people beyond just words in their textbook uh, so hopefully that'll really help and um, them explore the topics in front of them things like arguments for the existence of God is there, uh, evolution is a section, and also Christian attitudes towards creation. So um, some great things there if you've got good materials. So hopefully they'll be helpful. <laughs> 